Muy bien, muy buenas tardes a todas las personas. Good afternoon to everyone present today. I open here number three of the 185 period of sessions of the commission, which has the title Social Protests and Indigenous Peoples in Ecuador and has been requested by the Confederación de Nacionales Indígenas del Ecuador, CONAIE, Confederación de Nacionales Indígenas de la Amazonia Ecuatoriana, CONFENAIE, Consejo de Pueblos y Organizaciones Indígenas Evangélicas del Ecuador, PEINE, Confederación Nacional de Organizaciones Campesinas Indígenas y Negras, FENOCIN, Nacionalidad Guarani de Ecuador, Organización Guarani of Pastaza, OAP, Nacionalidad Siecopai of Ecuador, NACEPAI, Coordinadora de las Organizaciones Indígenas de la Cuenca Amazónica, COICA, and the Fundación Alianza Seibo, Amazon Frontlines AF. My name is Estuardo Rolón, first vice president of the commission and special rapporteur for Ecuador. Today, we I'm joined by Esmeralda Rosena de Tortinio, Commissioner Roberta Clark, and Commissioner Carlos Bernal. Commissioner Esmeralda Rosamena de Tridinia is the special rapporteur for indigenous peoples and also the executive secretary, Talia Renault, ad hoc executive secretary, Maria Claudia Pulido, special rapporteur for economic, social, culture, and environmental rights, Soledad Garcia Munoz, and the special rapporteur for freedom of expression, Pedro Vaca. I would like to greet the state and the civil society, and I would like to explain the structure of our agenda. In this hearing, we will have a 20 minute participation by the civil society. Afterwards, the state will have 20 minutes. The commission will also use 20 minutes to give its comments, we will give the floor back to the civil society for 12 minutes, the state for 12 minutes, and then we will conclude the hearing. So I could like to thank you once again for being present today. And without further ado, we will start this hearing. Now the civil society has 20 minutes. Could you please allow us to share a screen? Thank you. Greetings, members of the Intermediate Commission on Human Rights. I would like to greet the representatives of the state and the national government, the public in general, that is watching such an important hearing. The goal of this hearing is to present before the commission a detailed description of the situation of permanent exclusion of indigenous peoples within the public policies in the state and to show that the gaps, the barriers, and the constant application, violation of collective rights, in particular, in connection with economic, social, cultural, environmental rights, which has caused a process of structural inequality, which is permanent throughout the history 
of the state of Ecuador. That's why we believe it is very important to present in this hearing how these effects make indigenous and peasant population to be always forced to protest in Ecuador in order to demand the adoption of public policies that provide an answer to the great demands to these structural issues we experience indigenous peoples and peasant communities. At the same time, we believe it is very important to share in this space the detailed information about violent scenarios we have lived when we protest. That is why the uprising in July 2022 and October 2019 uh, took place in that social, political, economic context. The indigenous movement is part of this process so that we can present our demands to the state. Throughout this process, we have participated in the CONAIE, FEINE, and the basin at a global level. That's why uh, the members of FEINE will make their presentation and the members of the other organizations as well. Thank you. We would like to ask if our colleague from Feine has been able to connect. We have this problem because he has some technical issues, but in order to move forward with this hearing, what a member of FEINE was going to mention was a detailed description of the current situation of indigenous peoples and how that context has made those nationalities and peoples to implement mechanisms related to the right to protest in order to demand the state of Ecuador for answers for the situation of violence and exclusion. As the president of Conaie pointed out, the indigenous population, according to the state, is about 7% of the national population. And we would like to point out that the census was carried out in 2010. We have no updated figures, which shows the state doesn't have a updated statistics to implement the correct public policies. The current government supports its policies in the National Plan of Development or Creation of Opportunities, which is a plan developed by President Lasso. That government plan was not developed with the participation of peoples and nationalities and we are concerned about it, for example, regarding privatization and precarious working conditions, the lack of public policies for uh, and with indigenous peoples, the increase of mining and oil exports, which are carried out without consultation, which is imposed on indigenous territories and the decrease of the public policy, which is carried out through the uh, reduction of public expenses. There are private interests over that are imposed over public interest. All measures and agreements signed with the IMF in 2019, which led to protests have been maintained and those economic adjustments have not been reverted 
or are not are not favoring any indigenous populations, not only in uh, during Moreno's administrations, but under Lasso's administration, new measures that are favoring the uh, fulfillment of agreements with the IMF in detriment of relations um, uh, political rights. We can move forward, please. We want to put emphasis on the fact that in September 30, 2020, a new agreement with the IMF was signed. 6.5 billion dollars and the conditions under which this was signed affects the population that was already suffering the health uh, crisis those economic adjustments continue to occur through tax reforms the reduction of fiscal deficit and a public policy that has been oriented to the increase of mining and export and oil export. There are at least 730 million that are part of that adjustment, but doesn't mean uh, an improvement of conditions. It means the reduction of expenses in terms of uh, education, health, unemployment, which have been reduced since 2019. Those elements increase poverty, the lack of warranties for the fulfillment of economic, social, cultural, environmental rights, and the enjoyment and exercise of the right to protest and mobilize. Hello, members of the commission, members of the state, and to the audience in general. In order to continue with this, I would like for you to confirm whether you can see my screen and my slides. Do you see them? Please confirm if you see my slides. Yes. No, we do sí. see that there is a screen being shared. Sorry, but we do not see the progress of the slides. We only see one slide on screen. They are not moving, at least in my screen. Yes. That seems to be the case. The screen is being shared, but slides are not moving. We only see the first slide. Would you please give us a couple of seconds to solve this technical issue? Now it works. So continuing. With this context, let me tell you about poverty and the lack of social, economic, and cultural rights guarantees because the national government tried to implant this idea that there are no triggers. And through several campaigns, they would say that there were no triggers and that the indigenous population's agenda was creating instability, but figures and statistics offer us a context and leave aside this official discourse that was tried to be implanted. And in terms of social, economic and environmental rights, we see neoliberalism in this financial policy translated in the terrible signs and indexes of poverty and lack of employment. Also, in terms of social rights, we have the migration waves to the US that really affected indigenous populations. Having communities in the center of the country with more than 90% of their population and families migrating. And in terms of environmental rights, the situation keeps on seriously affecting the territorial rights of these peoples. And going back to these economic figures, we see that poverty reached 25% and extreme poverty 10.7% in June 2022. And here we see that an important element for social mobilization and the legitimate right to resistance took place. 
Also, Ecuador is the third country with the highest inequality in the region, only following Colombia and Brazil. And this shows the gaps between the national government and financial elites and the society in general, in general especially peoples and minorities who are mostly affected by extreme poverty. And in terms of employment rates, we see that the unemployment rate in 2019 was 4.2% and increased to 5.2 in 2021. And women and rural populations are those that were more impacted. Moreover, in 2021, there was an increase of basic salary from 200 to for, from 400 to 425 dollars. But in uh, also the family basket includes 75 basic products and its price increased to 735.15 dollars. And this shows a huge inflation rate affecting very much these small populations and impacting mostly these populations. Moreover, we see how the national government is not paying attention to their demands. Also, in terms of migration, the numbers are quite alarming with almost 80,000 Ecuadorians leaving the country. And this shows that almost 3,600 were children and teenagers. So this is a second migration wave. The first one took place before. And now the main destination used to be Spain in the first migration wave. But now the situation has changed right now. The destination for migrants is the US. Also, the indexes of criminality and prison assassinations are also increasing because the lack of fulfillment of social and economic rights are truly affecting all these situations. This is my intervention in terms of the national context. Good afternoon, everyone. I represent the indigenous populations from Ecuador. As you all know, in 2021, Guillermo Lasso's government created a public policy for the expansion of the extraction model without considering how this would affect the rights of indigenous populations and communities and the environmental and social damages that already were in place. The government issued Decree 95 about the oil policy, Decree 151 about mining, and these two decrees we're going to directly affect indigenous populations and communities. And there was no consultation process before passing these decrees. So the right to consultation was also ignored in the implementation of decrees. And also the national government justified that the free and previous consultation was not viable there because exploration was there before the constitution of 2008. Decree 151 has the goal of giving mining licenses through agile processes, giving priority to the later control. So in this configuration, the mechanism of right to consultation has no place in the territories of indigenous populations. The national government has not adopted any measures whatsoever in order to remedy environmental damages caused by mining places. 
there are more than five oil leaks per week and this has not been remedied after April 7, 2020, where 15,800 barrels of oil were leaked. And this was also seen in the leak of April, where thousands of oil barrels were also leaked in indigenous territories. And in these territories, there are activities that are highly contaminating, and we can see there the lack of presence of the national government. Civil society has conducted a study from 2016 to January 2022, which do not cover all the provinces or communities where 354 cases of cancer detective have been registered. From these numbers, 72% are women and 28% are men. The state has not conducted any study whatsoever. They have self-identification of the patients and there are no cancer units after 50 years of oil operations. 6.9% of the territories of indigenous peoples have mining activities licensed and 28.5 of these mining sites are within these territories. Therefore, in 13 out of the 17 indigenous communities and areas, the study, the state, sorry, must have done consultation processes reaching for consensus, but this has not happened. This lack of consultation creates serious issues in the social networks of communities, indigenous and non-indigenous. And the recent case, October 22nd, Alba Bermeo, an environmental activist was murdered in the context of illegal mining, which is not controlled by the national state. Opening these mining processes will increase the number of hectares licensed, and this will in turn increase the risk of affecting the collective rights of peoples and nature. And this despite the agreements and not conceding new mining licenses up to the moment where there is a law of previous consultation and consent. Thank you very much. Now we are going to ask Mr. Enrique for his participation. Good afternoon. The Council of Feine would like to say hello to the Honorable Commission in its 155 period. Let me now start with the following. In Ecuador, 7% of the population are indigenous populations in, in the country. And in 2019, we, are, we started dealing with a very serious financial and socioeconomic crisis affecting the most vulnerable sectors, especially peoples and communities. And with the lack of government proposals guaranteeing the need to reduce fiscal deficit without sacrificing the improvement of the living conditions of Ecuadorians. These together with the lack of public policies with budgets considering indigenous populations. So in this reality, we, in order to fulfill the needs of our populations in June 2022, had to exercise the right to resistance set forth in our constitution and go out to the streets in a peaceful way, just like we did in 2019. The state, through a violent response with people dying and then criminalizing social protests, Organizations then, FEIN, ECONAI, FELOSIC, which are indigenous population, indigenous organizations, presented 10 complaints. First, to reduce oil or gas prices from 
point fifty five to two one and diesel prices to be reduced to and also we need fair prices for some products we need an increase in the budgets of health and education we need the social security ecuadorian institute to be paid all of its debts mining borders must be respected respecting the 21 collective rights included in our constitution also which is a constitution from 2008 we need to guarantee the security and safety of our citizens too after these guidelines and complaints proposed more sectors felt identified and related to these therefore in this context we would like to request the commission to conduct follow-up considerations after the agreements reached in the table of dialogue thank you very much to complement this information we after what happened in october 2019 we had valued the commission's report and after fulfilling these recommendations at least by protesters we had for one year a democratic process where as of june 11th 2021 in the province of cotopasi we presented the documents that after one year became the national demands moreover after this process on october 4th 2021 in the dialogue table with the national government we had left these same proposals however it was so painful for us to see the president of our country to go out and stigmatize and criminalize and finally as if we were the internal enemy in ecuador we remember when the president of the republic in his previous in previous occasions manifested at a global level the situation about violence that was exerted by the indigenous movement in ecuador however with this democratic spirit after hearing these comments on november 10th 2021 we came to complain again with no results or responses whatsoever so as my colleague said the demands of the national strike in 2022 that were mainly related to three topics first the problem of poverty indicators in this country and the statistics showing highest percentages located in indigenous populations second problem extractivism the right to previous consultation is not being guaranteed they are just taking the territories of indigenous populations in order to exercise their rights to develop the ecuadorian state but without considering the vulnerability that indigenous populations and territories suffer and the third topic related to this situation is the aggression i'm sorry to interrupt but you have exceeded your time for five minutes so i need to stop you now you will have time by the end to resume so now i would like to thank you for your participation and we will compensate that at the time at the end so that you'll be able to finish your ideas by the end so now please stop sharing your screen so that we can hear from the state well we will close our presentation here and then by the end we are going to share more elements thank you very much yes thank you thank you for understanding and now we are going to continue with this hearing and in order to be fair we are going to be offering five extra minutes to the state if they'd like to or 
You can use your 20 minutes and I will then give the floor to the state and you have a max time of 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And yes, from the state, we will try to comply with our presentations within the stipulated time. And we thank you for offering five extra minutes. So good afternoon, Mr. President Rolón, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena, Commissioner Roberta Blake, Tania Renault, Maria Claudia Pulido, and everyone in the commission connected to this session. I would like to greet everyone that is part of the CONAIE, FENOCINE, FEINE, and Amazon Frontlines. On behalf of the state, we would like to thank you for inviting us and to deal with social protests and indigenous peoples in Ecuador. We hope to uh, get to know your comments about these issues that should be taken into account by competent authorities in our country. After this brief introduction, I would like to present the Ecuadorian delegation. The Human Rights Secretary, Paola Flores, Minister of the Government, Mr. Jimenez, Ministry of Education, Mrs. Brown, also the Public Ministry, Maria Fernanda Alvarez, National Director of Human Rights, Mr. Spin, and Dr. Fonseca. And on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, myself. The presentation of the Ecuadorian delegation will be made by Paola Flores, Secretary of Human Rights, and afterwards, Mr. Francisco Jimenez, and Ministry of Education, Mrs. Brown. I will now give the floor to Paula Flores so that she can start the presentation by the state. Good afternoon to all the commissioners of the commission, the special rapporteur on economic, social, culture, environmental rights of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, representatives of the indigenous communities in Ecuador, representatives of the Ecuadorian state, and members of the civil society. Good afternoon to everyone. As the state, we are grateful for this invitation to this thematic hearing to deal with social protests and indigenous peoples in Ecuador to us as state social protest, which is peaceful, is an element that allows the consolidation of the democratic society because the population can express their rights. That's why the state has adopted legislation in that regard that should comply with international standards that arise from international norms which have been ratified. We have shared information with the Commission and the national government has acted according to the defense of the peaceful social protest in June 2022 and has complied with international duties regarding the rest of the population. Thus, in order to protect the persons participating in this peaceful protest through government institutions, we have implemented safe uh, points so that people in a situation of vulnerability and those that are part of priority groups um, enshrined in the constitution of the Republic receive health attention and exercise their rights according to the needs that have been identified 
this measure was an efficient mechanism in order to provide comprehensive uh, attention within the context of these protests in order to protect the rights of the persons that were not part of the peaceful social protests there were humanitarian corridors in order to transport food and health supplies that in some uh, to some cities in the country also there were uh, family unification processes in order to address issues during the protest, we are convinced that dialogue and joint work articulated within public functions, civil society, and different organizations will allow, will allow us to move forward in order to guarantee the enjoyment of rights for the population as a whole, in particular, the populations that have been historically discriminated. We have constantly invited the society to keep a peaceful protest in order to maintain a dialogue open so that we can address the structure issues, proposed solutions and public policies that are effective in order to favor society, but in particular, the indigenous peoples that were participating in these protests. We agree with the analysis carried out by the Special Rapporteurship uh, for Freedom of Expression uh, and the 2005 report, which says that the lack of access of traditional channels for participation for such sectors of the population, the state has the duty to warranty rights to protest, social peaceful protest, in this case, as in Colombia, the commission recommended that it should promote and reinforce national dialogue processes with a territorial approach that allows all sectors to be heard, in particular, those that have suffered discrimination, historic, historical and structural discrimination, taking into account the standard are created by the commission and dialogue table public policies have been developed in order for the state to guarantee human rights of the population in general and the rights of indigenous peoples in order for them to enjoy their rights we have worked in different areas such as uh, collective rights uh, rights to freedom social economic or cultural environmental rights with intercultural gender and equality non-discrimination approach we should also highlight that the national government is committed to make decisions uh, hand in hand with the uh, public with the civil society to implement policies through a participatory process transparent process together with process that assess impact in terms of progressiveness that allow us to provide structural solutions and permanent solutions. Currently, there are public policies being developed in order to support the strengthening of the comprehensive development of uh, Afro-Ecuadorian um, different indigenous peoples in Ecuador in order to strengthen economy, governance, accessibility of indigenous peoples and after Ecuador and Maldives communities in Ecuador prioritizing the development, the creation of networks and media outlets, which are public and private community schools in order to uh, foster the development of indigenous peoples. And this is carried out by the state. The national state respectful of the competences and duties of the state is currently developing a guide for mechanisms of cooperation between indigenous justice and ordinary justice regarding different proceedings and also the possibility of filing habeas corpus for um, members of indigenous communities since 2021 58 virtual 
tables have been carried out with different uh, actors and 89 uh, technical tables for the creation of the plan for the creation of opportunities 2021-2025, which is made up by economic, social, e comprehensive security, ecological transition, uh, and other elements as well, which are constantly being monitored. This instrument is aligned with all the uh, 2030 agenda and the SDGs with a comprehensive approach in order to provide solutions to the main structural problems suffered by the inhabitants, the private sector and citizenship in order to guarantee human rights of all persons who live in Ecuador. The dialogue tables that have finished a few days ago and are currently being developed, these technical tables have shown that the government has the commitment to fulfill, comply with international standards for the protection of human rights, but especially the recommendations made by the commission. Thus, we have shown that it is possible to reach consensus in order to deal with the structural issues and demands of the population through the adoption of public policies to favor the majority with a territorial approach and taking care of groups that have been historically discriminated and who undergo a situation of vulnerability. The communities, nationalities, indigenous peoples, which are a fundamental pillar for the development of our country. Thank you. Adelante, Ministro Francisco Jiménez. Minister Jiménez, you have the floor. You are on mute. Good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon, members of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, members of the civil society organizations, indigenous organizations, um, the different uh, professionals, lawyers that are here present, all the officials of the state, ministers. Good afternoon to everyone. We have a presentation and I would like to share my screen. Let's try to share the screen. Let me see. Before starting with the presentation, I could like to make reference to some structural conditions because we have a presentation organized based on what occurred in the protests. And as you have seen this, that has to do with the 18 day protests and everything that has to do with that, with those events. It is very important to make reference to some, some structural uh, problems that the organizations uh, mentioned because the narrative has to be compared with the figures of the reality. So what was the situation the uh, government received in May 2021, some structural issues that are very important. First of all, a, a deficit, 7,100,000 uh, dollars, and the, this represents a great value taking into account the national GDP, 100 million dollars in national reserves, taking into account this deficit. And this meant that uh, expenses and debts could not be paid. The other structural situation has to do with the fact that the country was starting to get out the pandemic situation and there was a lack of vaccination um, due to the policies implemented by the previous government. And taking this into account, most of the population was not vaccinated, 
and that represented a huge problem from economy and the country as a whole and a series of structural situations that have been mentioned by the civil society organizations a series of social groups were left aside it was called a process of development but this also emphasized some uh, situations of uh, inequality within the, the society. What has the government done? Deficit is not of 7.1 billion, but 1.8 billion. So this has been reduced by 70%, this fiscal deficit. So we can now pay our accounts, our debts. And the structural adjustment and the reduction of the deficit may not be that good. In fact, the direction of the deficit is not good or bad. It de depends on the uh, um, where the money goes to and how the adjustment is made. The adjustment or, or that reduction has not meant um, any consequences to social sectors. In 2022, the investment was of 1,990 dollars, 3,500 dollars in health sector, just to mention a few. And in average, in 2021 to 2022, the investment was of 13 billion dollars. If we compare that with the the previous uh, period of 11 billion and from 2010 to 2016 and this uh, average is even lower so we are exceeding the investment being made in the past so we have been responsible reducing the debt of this the public debt without affecting social sectors so that is something that should be stated and we can see that if we look at the figures regarding the pandemic i would like to say that that was the first public economic measure and we were able to reach 86 percent um vaccination within the population um and that has enable us to overcome the crisis and this is an example um, at a global level this was the first important measure implemented by the government and a report presented a few days ago um, ecuador was going to be one of the main countries the countries to reduce the greatest uh, percentage of um, poverty. So there was a reduction from 14% of poverty to 7%. So indexes regarding reduction of the debt, fighting poverty, social investment, represent and commitment an improvement carried out by the state in order to reduce the situation of inequality. In order to explain what occurred in the last 108 days, 18 days, I'm going to share the slides. These 18 days of protest meant more than a thousand million dollars in economic loss. There was violence in 10 provinces, lack of supply, and this also affected mobility. There were seven deaths in 18 days. Every human life is a world, and we respect that above all. But taking into account protests and the violent scenes that took place in some parts of the national territory, we believe that the government 
acted accordingly so that no more lives were lost. There were 600 injured. There were two attempts, uh, coup, coup attempts. They did not occur. In the streets, there were certain statements. Some people said that the goal of these protests was to overthrow the government. We signed a peace agreement. This is a historical process for the country. We established tables of dialogue. This was not easy. We had a scenario of opposing perspectives and violence as that made this process very complex. It was possible to move forward. And with the members of different organizations and the government, we have tried for this dialogue to enable a dialogue between the government and social organizations. We have signed different agreements that are very important for the institutionality of the country. For example, regarding hydrocarbons, we eliminated a decree regarding hydrocarbons and we made certain reforms regarding mining uh, activities in the Ecuador so that these activities are not carried out in archaeological areas, uh, areas of hydric um, protection, ancestral territories, and these could not be carried out without a free prior informed consent. In table five of non-renewable resources and energy, in point 35, agreement 35, we establish a one year moratorium or unless having uh, free prior informed consent in 15 blocks. In these agreements, there were 218 agreements that were much more than uh, the 10 original demands. And when a country is able to face problems with justice, with equality, that is something good for our country. So in those 218 agreements, there was 885 million uh, investment between 2022-2025, which adds up to the investment we have mentioned before. So on June 30, the Acta por la Paz was signed, then the tables were established, and the follow-up commission was set up too. And this is the process that we are going through right now, where the implementation and the follow-up of the different agreements has been created. And finally, the agreements document was signed October 14th. So as I said, we had all the agreements and disagreements. In two tables, there was total agreement, one of private and public banking, and in the other one in higher education. On the rest, there were partial agreements. And one of the most complicated ones was the one related to subsidies, but still there were four agreements from that table. And today we are going through the implementation phase, which includes some aspects included in the opportunity plan proposed by the government on behalf or actually in the hands of the planning department and we know that public policies have a cycle including four phases the first one completed which is the formulation now we are in the coordination state or stage in order to create real timelines and instruments, then would come the implementation and the follow-up to be clear about what is being complied with and what is not. We, as the Ministry of Government, have summoned a coordination table that will take place one time every two months, having delegates from the different sectors, and we'll be able then to reach agreements. We have 
a timeline established where everyone can have access to the website of the ministry and to the dissemination and on what was agreed. And also we have the different categories for this to be implemented gradually. For example, 93 agreements being managed by the executive and many others related to generating rules and regulations. We have all of the agreements here. I know that I have very little time, but there is a very important thing that I would like to use as the final idea for my intervention. We received a state which was in very poor conditions, and we have dealt with these problems with decision, justice, and especially with transparency with the different social organizations. Unfortunately, the different conditions that led to the June protests were not provoked by the government, but we confronted them with all the human rights tools and with the legal justice in our hands. And after that, considering these difficult situations, we implemented, I'm sorry, sir, sorry to interrupt you, but we need to wrap up right now. I'm very sorry. And please, Let's stop sharing your screen. Thank you for all the information. Yes, of course. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Pues very well, thank you very much. We would like to thank the civil society and the state for all the information provided. And now we are going into the second part of the hearing, which are the comments by the commission. And in this case, as the president of this hearing and as the rapporteur for Ecuador, I am going to be very brief in my intervention. First of all, I would like to highlight that given this issue as the commission, it is very important for us to be aware of all the things that are happening. But unfortunately, for time reasons, none of the parties was able to include many details that might be important to us. Therefore, I would like to invite the civil society, indigenous populations and the state to send us in writing any information whatsoever. We, we still will have more time by the end of this hearing, but I am sure that there is a valuable information that could be sent to us in writing. The other aspect that I would like to highlight is that considering some structural situations that were described by both parties with different perspectives, but both acknowledging that there's a structural issue on which we should work. It is very important for the dialogue to be kept, for the dialogue not to be closed down, because it is only through dialogue that public policies can be accompanied or that public policies can be agreed upon so that to have enough importance and relevance and impact in a moment such as this one. So as, as a commission, constantly we've been constantly monitoring what has been happening in Ecuador. And it is very important to stress how important it is for us as a commission for there to be a communication bridge, a constant communication bridge where situations can be discussed and improved or for them to take place so that this possibility never stops because any recommendation that we might offer at any given time as the Inter-American Commission will be able to be implemented and articulated given the existence of this platform of dialogue. So now, since we don't have much time, and I am sure that my colleagues 
and also the secretary and special reporters would like to say something. So now I would like to ask you for figures and data because there were some data presented by the state in terms of budgetary issues. How was the situation when they took office, the cost of the agreement, how they intend to conduct certain actions. I believe that is important information and without a doubt, representatives of the indigenous populations and communities represented today have a very different perspective with some data that maybe you are not sharing here or maybe you have more information if you could please send us all that information so that our analysis can be as thorough as possible so all the information including figures and data and what is effectively being conveyed through a public policy serving indigenous populations, that would be very important. So that is the information that I would like to request from you. And also there was a guide of coordination mechanisms and communication mechanisms mentioned between indigenous justice and national justice that was only mentioned in one of the presentations. So I would like to request both parties, indigenous populations and the state to send us and to deepen on that situation, whether there is communication and whether that is a real thing. So basically these are my comments and questions. So now I will give the floor to our rapporteur, Commissioner Esmeralda Arosemena. Commissioner, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President of the hearing, Mr. Estuardo. I would like to greet everyone. And I like to say, I like the way in which Ecuadorians say, buenas tardes con todos, instead of a todos, as we usually say. So after having 11 or 12 organizations presenting from the civil society, that were present here. I would like to greet these organizations. I would like to greet the representatives from the state. And I would like to thank you all for all the information that we have received. And without a doubt, the commission's hearings have this purpose. And this is why we would like to thank you very much. And we are so thankful to, or for being able to hear from both parties and to gather all these valuable information about the topic that brought us here today. I would like to know more details and more precision by the state that has offered a set of answers that were offered precisely with the formula of tables of dialogue, which are now tables or follow-up tables, and according to the your organizations from the civil society, it is mentioned that throughout that process in order to reach agreements, now the problems reside in how these agreements will become effective. So I would like to know, especially about two aspects, the extension of the extractive borders, which for indigenous peoples and communities is fundamental, given that this would affect their rights to land and territory, their natural resources, and their very own protection of the environment from pollution. So what is according to what the organizations are posing, what is this process of the extraction borders? Is this a process being expanded? So I would like to have more precise information about how this is being handled. And also, the organizations have stated that in this follow-up process, the state said that adjustments 
have not affected social responses. Organizations are telling us a completely opposite thing, that this way in which they deal with the debt directly impacts fundamental rights especially social, economic, and environmental and cultural rights. And this would not be the way according to them. And also public policies, the state have stated, and I share Mr. President's comments on the fact that we need more information in order to process it the right way. So, when peoples, communities, and nations are demanding rights, and especially for Ecuador, the rights set forth in their constitution, collective rights for indigenous peoples. So I would like to hear about that, and organizations will also make their comments in this direction. But then I would like to have the state's perspective about these fundamental issues in terms of how these agreements are followed up, complied with, and considering also the results expected by the indigenous populations from this entire process of the peace document, which according to the state, this was widely expressed. That would be it, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Commissioner Esmeralda. Now I will give the floor to Commissioner Roberta Clark. Thank you very much, Commissioner Rolon, and good afternoon to everyone. And I want to thank Commissioner Esmeralda for her, 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 her thoughts and also her questions, which I do endorse. I have just uh, a, a, few, a few questions. Um, a, a lot of the state's response um, seems to me, from what I understand, to have dealt with the, the rationale for the fiscal adjustment measures um, for the need to reduce some social expenditure within a period of time um, for the, the necess necessity of engaging in, in investments, I suppose, in hydrocarbons as well as in the mining industry. So uh, a rationale was given for the fiscal adjustment measures. I understand from the civil society organizations, however, that they are saying that those measures that were taken by the state have had a disproportionately negative impact on the indigenous people's communities. For one, they were not, then they, they, they are marginalized, excluded community, and were themselves not part of the, the public policy consultation process, generally speaking, that the indigenous peoples are outside of public policy consultation. And so that's the first thing, that they're already structured in the Ecuadorian society in the most unequal situation. And uh, I think the statistic I heard, <clears throat> excuse me, was that Ecuador is the third most unequal country um, in the region. And certainly uh, indigenous peoples suffer from extreme poverty and extreme exclusion. And so therefore starting with that vulnerability, that history, the, the, the fiscal adjustment measures have had definitely a disproportionately negative effect on them. And then the, the, the second thing I hear the Indigenous Peoples Association saying very clearly here is that the decree on the hydrocarbons as well as on the mining to which the state also referred were adopted without uh, consultation or without sufficient consultation with the Indigenous Peoples communities. And those decrees uh, will have a negative effect on them given the the history of contamination um, of the land, of the ancestral lands, and also the negative effects generally of the extractions. I'm not clear, so my question is this, it's not clear to me, what was the level of consultation around the decree and the, the, the licensing 
um, or the potential licensing of, of, of companies to do extraction in, in areas which are either within ancestral lands or around. And then what are what is the evidence of, of free and informed consent? And um, um, if you said it, I, um, Representative State, I do apologize for not hearing it, but I would like to hear a little bit more about that process from your point of view of the of obtaining the free and informed consent of Indigenous people's organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Clark. Now I'll give the floor to the next commissioner, Mr. Bernal. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to have a word here. And I would like to thank petitioners, the state and my colleagues. I have one comment and one question related to what Commissioner Clark has just mentioned. And the comment is the following. As far as I was able to read, and after what I've seen in this hearing, this story of the dialogue between the government of Ecuador and indigenous populations after the protest is a success story because I understand that up to now, you've had 218 agreements reached in collaboration tables between the parties involved. And these agreements come from the government acknowledging structural deficiencies that the ministry brought about in this hearing. And these agreements are related to the increase of standards in terms of the protection of social rights of indigenous populations. And also there's a very important point, which is the one related to the previous consultation. From my perspective, this information was successful, but there was a degree or a regulation that was revoked before and tomorrow there will be a table being installed where they'll be negotiating a proposal to present a new regulation about this right to previous consultation. I don't know whether this information that I have read is correct or not, and this is why I am asking you this question, because from my perspective, in terms of the right to previous consultation, if the model will be having a discussion for a new bill that, as I read, would include some extraction projects that are very important for Ecuador to have moratorium and also a table with the technical assistance of the Commission and the UN, this would be a model that should be made public and should be presented into the world as a role model for other countries. So about this last point, this goes against the information that I've read, what the indigenous organizations have presented goes against what I have read before. So I would like to ask both parties for clarification. Thank you. Gracias, Comisionado. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I will now give the floor to the special rapporteur, Soledad Garcia Munoz. Thank you, First Vice President. Greetings to the Commission, the Honorable State of Ecuador, and members of the Civil Society. I would like to congratulate this hearing and that the focus is not on the protest, but the causes of social protest in Ecuador. Causes that go date back to that visit and the report that was published in January 2020. And the relation between protests and economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights, which have been observed not only in Ecuador, but in many countries of the region where people went to the streets in order to demand for dignity. And I would like to establish within these uh, 
narrative that relation between right to protest and right to dignity of the person, the right to be heard what is missing in order to live with dignity. And in this hearing, we have heard there are two or three exes. I've been, we were not able to listen to the third one, but in connection with social protests in Ecuador uh, regarding poverty affecting um, indigenous peoples and the uh, expansion of extractivism, which is uh, connected to companies and human rights. We have heard interesting data by the state of Ecuador, and it could be worth it uh, if that could be sent to us. And this should be shared with the citizens in a clear manner so that citizens know how public uh, funds are being used how they are invested in their well-being. And in 2019 and in 2020, we have published recommendations to Ecuador in an annual report in order to fight poverty. And in connection with companies and human rights, we have participated in the efforts made by Ecuador in its uh, national plan regarding companies and human rights. And Undoubtedly, there is a need and urgency in Ecuador and in other countries in the region for economic measures to be adopted uh, through a consultation and an assessment of their impact on economic, social, cultural, environmental rights. This has been pointed out in our 2020 report, and there are many interesting tools in that regard. For example, the principles to assess impact on social rights. Also, the committee has made um, recommendations and in terms of companies and human rights, I'm concerned about the data provided by civil society that there are more than five oil spills per week, 5,000 oil barrels produced in Ecuador and the fact that the Amazon doesn't have cancer unit after so many years of mining activities. I would like to keep on discussing these points with both parties in order to know whether the state of Ecuador is uh, willing to make progress in their public policies in connection with human rights. Thank you. Thank you. Rapporteur, the Commission has some minutes at the end. We have our special rapporteur on freedom of expression. I will give him the floor for two minutes and a half. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank both parties for all the information that has been shared. Thank you, Mr. Rapporteur. We will now move to another stage in this hearing we are running out of time we have tried to balance time but we will now give the floor to the civil society for seven minutes and seven minutes to the state as well so that we complete pending 12 minutes i will now give the floor to the organizations of the civil society for seven minutes Taking into account what has been pointed out, we are concerned about the denial uh, of the visit requested by the commission regarding the strike that it was key because that shows the lack of compliance of the state to the recommendations made in 2019 and the obligations regarding protests. We are concerned about the abusive use of the mechanism of the state of emergency and that is aimed at encouraging the participation of armed forces in the control of the protests and that led to nine deaths in the context of the protest, 318 injured, many of them suffer from eye injuries, 199 uh, arrests, some prisoners disappear for several hours and at least 180 27 violation of human rights that affect the state. We would like to say that we are going to present a report after this hearing in order to 
response buyer of the uh, questions made and we would like to highlight the right to prior uh, consultation which is a right that is constantly violated by extractivism it is not um, true that mm, these Decree 95 was respected. Decree 95 was uh, eliminated after it uh, ended. And Decree 151 had different modifications, but strativism violates rights and violates right to free prior informed consent. And the warranties of dialogue do not correspond to the structural demands of the society, in particular, indigenous communities, Mr. President. I think it's very important to clarify certain data that have been presented because there's a constant reaction of uh, popular sectors. The indigenous population suffers from poverty the most. That's a reality. This is not only something that occurs in the mountains, but in the territory as a whole, and it's related to extractivism. 50 years of oil exploration in the country. It cannot be that the territories of the indigenous peoples suffer the development of the this sector. They are leaving thousands of hectares polluted. We are forced to produce there consume polluted products, we suffer cancer, diabetes, many diseases. This is a structural situation that is constant. Not this government, all the previous government have changed this. It cannot be that the development of the Ecuador depends on the uh, indigenous territories. We are the ones paying for this. The national government now wants to maintain development in the country and wants to use all resources, but now they want to use mining exploration, and this is going to increase poverty, mainly in the mountains. This is related to our territories. These mining territories also produce food for all the people of the Ecuador. So we are greatly concerned. 14% of the national territory that exceeds 5 million hectares in the countries and the greatest percentage of the territory of the indigenous people have mining activities and no progress has been made regarding free prior informed consent. Tomorrow, the commission will work on this uh, law in terms of free prior informed consent. And it's important to mention that in the di dialogue table, it was clear, as long as we do not make any progress in terms of free prior informed consent, we shouldn't make any programs in terms of mining activities. But now we believe that new licenses are being granted, and this is of great concern for mining for indigenous peoples. What the government says until today, and I request the authorities when the state keeps on saying that social struggles was to overthrow the government, that is a lie. That's why if there's a reaction in the citizens, we have always said that 10 demands have to be respected so that they are not confused with political acts that as the national government says. They have used this narrative in order to uh, send to prison, stigmatize and discriminate our population. I was illegally detained. I was detained. This was planned and in the report by the prosecutor's office, the officials that declared that they were following me for many days and they said that it was a flagrant uh, crime. That's why the judge ruled its, its dismissal. We have appealed and we will have a new hearing in January. We believe that in a democratic country, this should not occur. I would like to conclude now my presentation.
saying that. The dialogue tables out of 218 agreements, it is clear that 92 are agreements that could mm, progress. 102 are, we do not agree. That's why I request the authorities so that we are not discussing about this. We had requested a progress to be made in the implementation of a plan of agreement, an agreement plan, so that in the medium and long term, we could analyze by, by one the agreements that had been signed. Also, it is important to mention that now, apart from the problems we are going through in terms regarding economy and legit legitimacy, the 10,000 indigenous communities have said, this is our contribution to the state of Ecuador, to the society. We guarantee the control of the territories with our indigenous guards, but now they are being stigmatized. They said that irregular or paramilitary groups or accused of eh, many crimes. The contribution we are making with our community guards facing the level of crime, drug trafficking, we are being persecuted, stigmatized. Thank you. Thank you. We take down notes of what you have mentioned. We will now give the floor to the states for eight minutes. Thank you. Dr. Rallon, I would like to give the floor to Ministry Brown. And I would like to say that the state will share all the information that has been requested. So that is clear how everything has been managed. It is a holistic political viewpoint. Ministry Brown, you have the floor. Thank you. I'd like to greet all the commissioners, all the members of the organizations of the civil society and the national government. As part of a response and expanding information, what I can say, the ministry will participate afterwards, but I would like to say that we should look in detail at all the topics that have to do with energy and non-renewable resources, which is table five. Uh, but we have made progress on the other nine tables that were also very important. And I would like to make reference to, the minister has mentioned this, we have discussed uh, subsidies, price control, in productivity increase, collective rights, security, access to health, employment, labor rights, higher education, collective rights. This was a great challenge for us. And I think it's a good example of a good, of a best practice in this context, because this is a challenge for both parties and it had two main elements. This particular table worked on an issue that is very comprehensive, many topics that are part of collective rights, rights that are enshrined in the constitution, but, and this has been recognized in the table, have not been dealt with. And this has been a very important step. This is an essential element. It's a great challenge due to the great number of factors, state and members of the organizations that participate in the diversity of the topics that have been dealt with in this table. To be more specific, at this table, we had subtopics, and these were the excess of the intercultural bilingual educational system and school infrastructure. This excess was a sub-working table. Excess number two was self-determination and self-governance. And lands and territories for indigenous justice and uh, making reference to what 
was said by the president of Konaye, we recognized the regional scars in one of the agreements. This is one of the agreements what the Constitutional Court has already established, and there's agreement on that regard about such relevant topic. On the table, there were two moments uh, regarding education. We had uh, several agreements. In this table, we have discussed the guarantee of uh, intercultural bilingual uh, education, which is recognized by the Constitution, which has not been implemented before. 1,700 institutions uh, that guarantee intercultural bilingual education and a budget that we will include a $133 million and also a council at the global level that was mentioned by the organizations, the budget for education in 2022 in the Ministry of Education in comparison with 2021 was increased by 21%, 21% increase in the education budget, which shows what the ministry minister has said in this is part of the uh, economic measures. The budget allocated to health and education have not been affected and have been increased. In the case of the Ministry of Education, there was a 21 increase, as I have said before, which is quite important. On the other hand, although tables have provided this uh, pace for a dialogue, we had already included in our national plan regarding education, the strengthening of intercultural bilingual education, which is started in 2021, the reopening of rural institutions that had been closed, which are uh, located in indigenous communities. In 2021, 101 schools were open, and this year, 100 more. Also strengthening of curricula, contextualized curricula, 14 languages with its own curricula, and tools for Afro-descendants among the uh, peoples. This shows the will of the Minister of Education to keep on uh, maintaining dialogue in terms of education, to respect the agreements that were signed through the tables of dialogue, and we have made great progress in to comply with them. And this is an example that has been also carried out by either uh, ministers. Thank you for having listened to us and we will continue so that these democratic spaces, peaceful spaces are frequent in Ecuador and the region so that there are no demonstrations that hinder the development of inhabitants in an articulated way. Ministry Jimenez will uh, add further information. Thank you, Maria. And given that we don't have much time, I believe that the government, since the peace document was signed, the document ha the government has shown a change in its oil policy with degree 95 being revoked and degree 155 being amended. And after what I have just exposed that I cannot repeat now, related to protected area, intangible areas, and areas of water protection, among others. Also, in terms of table five energies, the text of the agreement signed by both parties says that there's going to be a temporary a rare period up to international treaties and court statements and the consultation processes be stated. Also, the participation of social organizations will be included for 
uh, their policies and actually 111 out of 218 agreements include the participation of social organizations. And this is related also to table five related to the modification of the oil policies in the country that will take place gradually. And also in terms of protests, we never took <clears throat> We never took decisions or made decisions that were not grounded. I am very sorry. I need to interrupt you, sir, for time reasons. I appreciate and I would like to thank also the state for your comments. We are reaching the end of this hearing. We have stayed here for longer than we had, but it was very important for us to have the space and time to hear you. And first of all, before adjourning this meeting, I would like to say that I believe this is a very relevant hearing because this is a space where through dialogue with the presence of the Inter-American Commission, we can hear the different points of view on structural and important issues about Ecuador and its indigenous populations. We have the president of the CONAI and the other social and indigenous organizations, ministers from the government also are also present. And this allows the commission to have the authorities related to decision-making processes in order to improve public policies and the potential advocacy in terms of the protection and exercise of every human right, including desk, social, economic, environmental, and cultural rights. Moreover, I would like to say that the commission has monitored and sent and read documents about the protests. Also, there is a series of recommendations that the commission on this topic has issued. And the commission would like to follow up the recommendations and also the agreements that were reached upon on these tables of dialogue. I would like to leave with the message that the issue of Ecuador and the indigenous populations in Ecuador is a very important aspect for the commission. There is the will from the commission to follow up this. We have our rapporteur of indigenous populations and as a rapporteur for Ecuador, we are truly willing to keep on fostering this space of dialogue so that this can continue on from our behalf. We will continue monitoring and following up the recommendations, thus trying to have more continuity for these contact points where situations can be improved. So we are going to be expecting the information that we have requested. And I would like to thank everyone present in this hearing. So without further ado, this hearing is adjourned. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. It's been an honor. Thank you very much.